So during this session, we will have to talk uh, looking a bit at the more uh, legal aspect of uh, privacy. The first talk will be given by Alexandra Wood from the Bergman Center at Harvard. Thank you. It's a pleasure to share today um, some research looking at the relationship between technical and legal approaches to privacy and some approaches to bridging the gaps between them. Um, I should note that the work that I'm talking about today is the result of an interdisciplinary collaboration between computer scientists, legal and, and policy experts and social scientists and information scientists um, across Harvard, MIT, and Georgetown, among other collaborators. Um, the motivation of our work stems from the inadequacy of current privacy frameworks and the practices that result from them. Um, in particular, we've observed that the current regulatory framework is ill-suited to protect privacy in the digital age. Uh, we see that regulatory requirements are ambiguous and open to interpretation. And it's often difficult, if not impossible, to understand what they're designed to protect. This is particularly true as technological developments challenge traditional understandings of privacy. Practical approaches may require time-consuming case-by-case review and negotiation. And this often results in markedly different treatment where the same or similar data sets held by different organizations are treated uh, markedly differently. We also see that underlying privacy concepts, such as personally identifiable information, seem fundamentally unable to keep up with the pace of technological change. Uh, regulatory frameworks um, seem to endorse ad hoc approaches that fail to provide adequate protection. Um, we see this, for example, in the HIPAA privacy rule safe harbor, uh, which requires the redaction of identifiers from a list of 18. Um, and we now know that um, this does not um, provide adequate privacy protection in practice. This is based on a, um, a faulty understanding of privacy um, being a, a um, a, a, a privacy protection being related to the, the redaction of identifiers or um, being related to the presence of PII. Um, when the regulatory framework recognizes only a limited set of privacy failures, um, such as record linkage um, being a, a primary mode of attack that uh, regulations are designed to prevent, and as a result, um, regulatory standards require frequent amendment um, because they're based on um, concepts that are ill-defined. Um, and one of the, the main um, weaknesses of the regulatory framework stems from um, privacy concepts that are not very well defined. Um, one of the main problems is the lack of generality in these definitions. Legal standards typically do not establish a general privacy goal to be achieved. Rather, they specify a technique to be used, such as the redaction of identifiers. Um, and this results in um, determinations needing to be based on a case-by-case -case contextual analysis. We also see that these privacy concepts are not very precise. Um, definitions of, of de-identification and anonymization are often tautological. Um, so personally identifiable information is defined as information that identifies a person. Or they may even set forth a standard that's impossible to meet, um, such as um, a, a, a data provider must ensure that there is no risk of re-identification. In addition, the satisfaction of a legal standard cannot be demonstrated with certainty. Um, it's often not clear um, that the standard has been met um, when it's based on a, a notion of, of reasonableness. And 
what we have learned um, from these many observations is that privacy has a hybrid nature. It, um, it involves both legal and technical aspects. Um, and the privacy regulations often rely on concepts that have both technical and legal meaning. Um, we see that the reliance on concepts such as identifiability, distinguishability, linkability, inference, risk, and others um, inherently have both technical and legal interpretations. These concepts play a central role in regulatory standards and criteria. Um, in order to comply with a privacy regulation, you often have to demonstrate that um, the, the risk of identifiability is very small or that the risk of linkability is very small. Um, but these concepts also have technical interpretations. They appear in the statistical disclosure limitation literature, for example, where um, definitions and approaches for um, achieving um, uh, privacy protection in accordance with these concepts are provided. Um, but at the same time, the, the legal and technical understandings of privacy are often not in harmony. And this is particularly true when comparing new formal privacy models like differential privacy to legal approaches to protecting privacy. Um, you, you start to see how this, this dual nature of, of privacy having the legal and technical components um, posing challenges when you need to reconcile their relationship to emerging concepts. Um, we've seen a number of gaps between technical and legal or normative concepts of privacy. One of these gaps is in the generality of protection that's provided. Um, regulatory requirements vary according to industry sector, jurisdiction, institution, the types of information and other contextual factors. Um, if you take the um, education privacy law in the United States, FERPA, which protects only certain information from education records maintained by educational agencies and institutions, um, particularly non-directory, personally identifiable information, it's a small subset of information that could be used <coughs> in a privacy attack. Um, and if you compare this to something like differential privacy, um, you see that it's, it's very limited in the protection that, that it affords. Um, we, we now know that in practice, privacy risks are not limited to the information categories and contexts contemplated by regulations. Um, we know that analysts may combine information from different contexts. Um, and formal privacy models like differential privacy recognize this. Um, they can be applied wherever statistical or machine learning analysis is performed, regardless of the context, and protect all information that's specific to an individual, not a, a limited subset identified in a regulation. Um, we also see gaps in the scope of attacks that are contemplated by regulations versus formal privacy models. Uh, regulations often contemplate a limited set of specific attacks and failures. Um, an example is record linkage, um, which can be understood as the re-identification of one or more records in a de-identified data set by uniquely linking those records with identified records in a publicly available data set. Um, in some privacy regulations, this is identified as the, the primary or, or sole uh, mode of privacy failure. Um, and they're designed um, to ensure that the risk of a record linkage to known auxiliary data sources is low. Um, but it ignores other types of privacy failures. Um, but this creates challenges when other privacy at attacks are identified over time. Um, some examples are confirming an individual's presence in a data set or singling out an individual in a data set, even if not fully identified, or inferring information specific to an individual with less than absolute certainty. Um, these are um, modes of, of privacy failure that are arguably not recognized in, by certain regulatory standards. 
However, uh, formal privacy models like differential privacy recognize the importance of protecting against these types of privacy attacks. Um, and um, they're designed to provide protection against a wide collection of privacy attacks, including those that are not currently known. We also see gaps in the expectations um, versus the scientific understanding of privacy. Regulations that rely on the concept of de-identification or anonymization are often not in agreement with the current scientific understanding of privacy. Uh, the regulations may be limited in scope. Um, they may not provide an adequate level of privacy in practice, and they may not withstand rigorous formal mathematical scrutiny. Um, an example of this is the HIPAA privacy rule safe harbor method, um, which requires redaction of certain identifiers, which we now know um, does not provide uh, strong privacy protection in practice. Uh, redaction of identifiers can fail to protect privacy, especially when applied to detailed information such as medical records. Um, we now understand that any information, even information not traditionally considered identifying, has the potential to leak information specific to individuals. Um, we also see gaps in the expectations versus the, privacy, the scientific understanding of privacy um, in certain statutes, which may be interpreted to require something that's not technically feasible, um, such as absolute privacy protection when sharing personal data. Um, you could take Title 13 of the U.S. Code as an example. It protects the confidentiality of respondent information protected by the U.S. Census Bureau and prohibits any publication whereby the data furnished by an individual can be identified. And if you were to interpret this language very conservatively, um, you could read Title 13 to disallow any leakage of information about individuals and, and therefore uh, disallow the publication of uh, large amounts of statistics. Um, we also see that this um, binary view of privacy found in Title 13, whereby information is either identifiable or not, um, is common to many regulations. Um, and there's some um, known problems with this approach. Um, information can never be made completely non-identifiable. This approach also fails to recognize that privacy loss accumulates with successive releases of information about the same individuals. And it can eventually lead to a significant disclosure of personal information, um, as we saw this morning. And in contrast, formal privacy models bound the privacy leakage of each release and bound the total privacy leakage across multiple releases. Um, we also see um, that normative concepts are often instable over time, um, whereas uh, technical concepts um, are based on un, uh, stable definitions. Um, the notions of privacy embedded in regulations are continually evolving. An example is um, guidance from the Office of Management and Budget budget to government agencies um, responding to uh, data breaches of, of uh, federal records. Um, this guidance has been updated over time to address new ways that de-identified data may be vulnerable to potential attacks. Um, the latest guidance in 2017 advises that information <coughs> that is considered non-personally identifiable information may become personally identifiable information in the future um, as new data sources become available. And as we see that hardwired techniques like the HIPAA safe harbor are shown to be inadequate to protect privacy, it's unclear how to satisfy regulatory standards um, like that one. Um, once they become out of step with best practice. And in contrast, differential privacy is the subject of ongoing scientific research. And regardless of implementation, there's a strong assurance that it provides a sufficient level of privacy in a wide variety of settings. Um, we also see gaps um, 
in the relationship to normative expectations. Um, comparing the, the protection afforded by a particular privacy technology to a normative standard must be done with care. Um, for example, it may be difficult to make a sufficiency claim with respect to differential privacy and regulatory requirements. Um, some examples of this um, we see with formal privacy models, which may be considered privacy first definitions, um, prioritize privacy, um, whereas real world uses of data may demand making a compromise between privacy and accuracy. Um, and there may be some cases where the regulations express requirements that can be interpreted to exceed the protection provided by formal privacy models. Um, we may see this in the case of Title 13, especially with respect to protections for establishments. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, can you expand on the, uh, the statement that uh, privacy models are privacy first? In my book, they are like privacy only. They only talk about privacy. Mm -hmm. They don't try to capture utility. It's done by some other definition, some other uh, metrics. Um, I think there may be others in the room who are better suited um, to answer this question, but I, I think that in, um, in the privacy parameter epsilon, there, there's the, the balancing of privacy versus utility. Um, but of course, it, it provides very robust um, privacy protection as, as the um, primary goal. Um, but I don't know if others want to weigh in. But if in your list there was only privacy, it's first, and maybe also last, but it's still first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, could the speakers speak up, please? Or maybe say who they are? It's Copy. hard to hear yes. back. Well, I, I was referring to Ilya's comment and saying, yeah, it's true that they... Um, now we'll give a different answer. Uh, it's, true, <laughs> it's true that the definition is, focuses on privacy, not on other stuff in particular utility and I think in that this is an exact embodiment of the privacy first approach. I mean when you look at a legal text you have to read both the text and you have to understand the backdrop against which it's written, right? And so Alexander was presenting a bunch of um, definitions from I think FERPA and maybe the the Grand Leach Belay, I don't remember, but about like, you know, definitions of personally identifiable information. And those definitions you have to read as political decisions to maintain certain kinds of utility, right? And so the laws do speak to both privacy and utility. It's just that they assume utility and then try to extract privacy kind of away from it, right? So they do speak to both those things. You know, it, the words might not be there, but like if you look at the legislative history, for example, you can see all the debates about what sort of utility wanted to be maintained. But I, I think talks this morning by John and Dan, Dan, Dan Kaper. Can you speak up, Ilya? Sorry. Uh, I, I think talks this morning uh, by John and Dan Kaper, the uh, were very explicit, explicit about uh, achieving privacy while uh, also uh, releasing some invariance basically for free because they have to. So I think it's uh, um, kind of, I, I wouldn't characterize privacy models as being rigid. They're like able to accommodate multiple objectives like privacy and utility in different orders. I have a very different question, but so if you want to continue this. Okay, um, so from what I gather, uh, there have been many, many losses in regard to the census. Has any of them ever touched upon the subject of privacy? Like, uh, again, I'm very ignorant when it comes to law, but what I do understand is there's the law and there's the court interpretation of it. So somehow it counts more, the court interpretation of the law. So has there ever been any sue you know, anyone sued the, the, the census based on privacy breaches? Or did it come to a court discussion? Or just the state of the law as written? Um, I am not aware of any lawsuits um, related to privacy breaches. Um, the uh, Supreme Court case that's most closely related 
to these topics is Baldridge versus Shapiro, um, which involved um, uh, challenges to the, the redistricting data and the need to obtain the raw data from the Census Bureau in order to uh, verify uh, those data tabulations. Um, and in, in that case, the Supreme Court held that um, Title 13 um, poses an absolute bar to the release of raw data to third parties. Um, but the confidentiality protections are very strong. Wasn't there uh, some sort of lawsuit against the census back after the 9-11 when there were Homeland Security was looking at the various pockets of ethnic groups? Or was that never taken to court? Or? Anyway, uh, there are lots of breaches, but they're probably not public. <laughs> so. Can't touch that question. <laughs> 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 so, we have released several analyses of um, breaches by government agencies. And, uh, they generally have involved uh, wartime or national security uh, uh, superseding of whatever privacy regulation was in place, but I'm not aware of any such um, of breaches since Title 13 was passed in 54, and both the Patriot Act and the um, um, Cybersecurity Acts up to 2015 specifically left the protections in Title 13 in place. The 2015 Cybersecurity Act uh, explicitly said that it uh, contravened all existing statutes, superseded is the right term, I'm sorry, all existing statutes, and that does involve some authorized government scrutiny of confidential Title 13 data in principle, but in fact, that authorization would require our private um, transport layer security keys, which have not been requested and have not been surrendered. So and the Department of Homeland Security has said that publicly. That's, as far as I know, that's the current state of the world. So in our work, um, we've aimed to come up with um, a variety of different approaches to um, providing privacy protection um, in, in practice or in, in theory. Um, and overcoming some of these gaps in, in, in the different concepts we see in, in the legal and, and technical literature. Um, the first approach um, that we've pursued is to develop a framework for privacy-aware data releases. Um, this framework is based on um, modern concepts of privacy um, from the theoretical computer science literature um, and it's also modeled on information security and information lifecycle frameworks. It involves three steps. The first is developing a catalog of privacy controls. The second is identifying information uses, threats, and vulnerabilities in a particular use case. And then designing data releases by aligning the uses and risks in a given use case with appropriate controls and doing so at each stage of the information lifecycle. So we developed um, a, an example catalog of privacy controls, looking at procedural, economic, educational, legal, and technical controls at each stage of the information lifecycle, um, from collection through access, release, and, and long-term use and storage. And we've developed a guide to selecting appropriate privacy controls um, and this is an example um, where you can look at the identifiability um, of the data um, after it's been transformed in some way. Um, so we see that there are some um, points given for illustration here. There may be direct or indirect identifiers present, or the direct and indirect identifiers may have been removed. 
or there may have been heuristic techniques applied, or there may have been rigorous um, SDL techniques applied, um, such as differential privacy. And along the other axis, axis you see um, the level of expected harm from negligible to life-threatening. Um, and in the regions, you see um, the different sorts of procedural and, and technical controls that would be appropriate given the identifiability and the level of expected harm, um, ranging from no additional controls uh, to um, the, the strongest controls, um, secure data enclaves and immutable audit logs. And you see that this um, differs from current practice in some settings. Um, if you take the HIPAA safe harbor as an example, where um, direct and indirect identifiers may have been removed, um, this framework would still recommend that notice consent in terms of service or even formal application and oversight for a data use agreement or se secure data enclave and immutable audit logs may be appropriate um, if the level of expected harm is, is high. Um, and we also recommend uh, using a tiered access model um, because this is a way to finally tune the level of protection to the intended uses of the data and the um, level of protection required. Um, so for example, some data sets may be made available through open query access using differentially private tools. Um, other data sets may be made available for download, either with sanitation or um, through a review and approval process. Um, and the, the most sensitive data um, may be protected uh, via a secure data enclave and only certain types of, of monitored uh, data uses are permitted. And this tiered access model um, is inspired by the Harvard Privacy Tools Project model, um, where data may be made available um, through different modes of access, um, either through um, download under the terms of a data use agreement or um, statistics may be made available to the public through a differentially private mechanism. And one of the, the questions that arose in the development of, of the differential privacy tools in this project was how do you ensure um, how do you assure the, the users of the differentially private tools that um, differential privacy is sufficient to satisfy uh, a, a data provider uh, data pro provider's obligations under the law? Um, and so another approach that we've pursued is bridging uh, legal and, and technical approaches to privacy by formally modeling legal requirements. Um, we've seen that, that the languages of computer science and, and regulation are very different. Um, are there ways to overcome some of these gaps? And one approach that we've looked at um, has the goal of rigorously arguing that a technological privacy solution satisfies the requirements of a particular law. This approach involves extracting a formal mathematical requirement from the law and proving mathematically that a technological privacy solution satisfies the requirement that was derived from the law. As an example, we modeled FERPA, um, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Um, and we used a game-based privacy definition to extract a formal model of the privacy desiderata uh, for this regulation. And the goal in developing this game-based privacy definition was to provide a concise and fairly intuitive abstraction of FERPA's requirements. And then to show um, that if, dif if differential privacy or another formal privacy model satisfies the definition, 
um, then we know that we have a strong argument that it satisfies the requirements of FERPA. And I can walk through some of the um, steps of developing this model of FERPA. The first step was to model the adversary. And we uh, looked at the definition of personally identifiable information within FERPA, which includes this language, um, information that alone or in combination is linked or linkable to a specific student that would allow a reasonable person in the school community who does not have personal knowledge of the relevant circumstances to identify the student with reasonable certainty. And we looked especially at that language um, highlighted in green here um, and took that to be FERPA's implicit adversary. We also modeled directory information um, as defined by FERPA. Um, this um, is language that's interpreted very conservatively. Um, we, we erred towards what interpretation is most beneficial for the adversary. This is because the definition of directory information found in FERPA is ambiguous. And if we were to make assumptions about the definition, um, new interpretations of directory information could call the assumptions we made into question. So instead, we let the attacker choose what constitutes directory information. And this makes the attacker very strong. It's a very conservative interpretation of the law. Um, and here is a simplified version of the FERPA privacy game, um, whereby the adversary is given the directory information and the computation is given the directory information and the non-directory personally identifiable information, the protected information. The computation returns a, a, res, a result. Um, the adversary takes the directory information and the computation result makes a guess of the private information and wins the game if the guess of the private information equals the private information. And um, in attempting to um, generalize this approach, um, we started to look at um, different uh, concepts that appear in various privacy regulations, like personally identifiable information, linkability to see whether it might be possible to interpret formal privacy guarantees in the language of these concepts. Um, so some common privacy concepts in the law include PAI, de-identification, linkage, inference, risk, consent and opting out, purpose and access restrictions. These concepts are interpreted differently across laws. They also appear in the technical literature, often with different definitions and interpretations than those that appear in the law. Um, we find that legal requirements that are relevant to issues of privacy and computation rely on, on an understanding of a range of different privacy concepts. Um, however, none of the privacy concepts that appear in the law refer directly to differential privacy. However, the differential privacy guarantee can be interpreted in, in reference to these concepts. And at the same time, it can accommodate differences in how these concepts are defined across different contexts. As an example, um, I'll look at personally identifiable information, which is a central concept appearing in privacy law. Uh, legal protections typically extend only to PII, and information not considered Personally identifiable is not protected. You see this in, in FERPA and the HIPAA privacy rule and other laws. And although the definitions vary significantly, they're generally understood to refer to the presence of pieces of information that are linkable to the identity of an individual or to an individual's personal attributes. <coughs> um, you should also note that PII is, is related to the concept of de-identification, which refers to a collection of techniques that have performed successfully um, are used to remove PII or to transform PII into non-PII. And we can interpret the differential privacy guarantee um, in the terms of this language. Um, we can do this even though PII does not have a precise technical meaning. And in practice, it may be difficult to determine whether information is personal, identifying, or likely to be considered identifying in the future. Um, 
Another challenge here is that the, the meaning of PII um, is typically um, interpreted uh, with respect to uh, data releases in a microdata or tabular format. Um, but its meaning with respect to statistical models or outputs of a machine learning system um, is unclear. However, when differential privacy is used, it can be understood as ensuring that using an individual's data will not reveal essentially any personally identifiable information specific to her, regardless of the definition of PII that is used. Um, so this is a, an interpretation of the differentially private guarantee. Um, using the language that you see in, in laws and regulations. Um, and this may be useful for explaining um, differential privacy and how it should be um, viewed with respect to legal obligations to policymakers. Um, and then a fourth approach that we've um, been exploring is this idea of a hybrid concept. Um, we recognize that privacy concepts are neither, neither purely legal nor purely technical. They have an inherent hybrid legal technical nature. Um, and adopting an understanding of privacy that is consistent across both its technical and normative dimensions will be critical to ensuring that personal data are adequately safeguarded over the long term. However, there are conceptual gaps between the technical and, and normative concepts that create challenges for arriving at a universal notion of privacy that's well understood within both communities and literatures. Um, understanding that the hybrid nature of these concepts and, and developing tools for implementing them um, will be necessary to bridge the gaps between current legal and technical understandings of privacy. Um, an example of a concept um, that recognizes the, the legal or normative and, and technical um, aspects of privacy is contextual integrity. Um, it, this is a framework that can be used where it's possible to encode norms formally and determine whether a particular information flow respects these norms. Um, for example, where the norms are unambiguous and effectively testable. Um, however, there, there may be other cases where the normative concepts are not defined explicitly, um, or they may be defined explicitly, but they're not expressed in a formal language that enables a precise analysis. Um, and so more research is needed to develop hybrid concepts um, that aim to, to capture the, the, the dual technical normative nature of privacy and some of the work, um, like the work to formally model legal requirements, um, is, um, exemplifies some work um, in this direction. Um, and we're also looking at ways to um, model uh, privacy concepts themselves, like singling out. Um, this approach involves identifying fundamental privacy concepts used in legal standards of privacy and the statistical disclosure limitation literature. Um, examples include singling out, linkability, and inference. And for each concept, we perform a thorough legal analysis and then construct a mathematical model of the concept. We check whether the modeling agrees with the legal analysis and then compare the model with differential privacy. Um, and for an in-depth example of this sort of analysis with respect to singling out, um, Loni Cohen um, will present on this on Wednesday. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. When you talk, when you, so you say identify the fundamental concept used in legal standards. And I'm just wondering what you mean by that. That's a great question. Um, so we've been looking for concepts that appear in multiple privacy regulations. Um, and singling out is a good example of this. Um, it 
is often um, given different names, like uniqueness or distinguishability or the ability to distinguish an individual. Privacy, but you're looking for particular rules that were adopted to address some sort of threat. Is that? Well, starting with the rules, but then trying to identify the, the concept that underlies the rule. So and what would be the concept that just? Singling out. Um, and you do see um, the similar concepts appearing again and again, where you see concepts of singling out um, appearing in, in the GDPR, but also in laws like HIPAA or FERPA and, and in the related guidance, where they try to flesh out what it means to single out an individual or distinguish an, an individual in a data set. Um, so the, the um, idea here is, is um, if you're able to um, prove that, that differential privacy is, is sufficient or, a, or for a particular um, approach to privacy is sufficient to protect against singling out, um, then you are able to show um, arguably that that technique is, is sufficient to meet a, a, a broad range of different privacy standards under the law. Um, and there may be opportunities uh, for future privacy regulations um, based on this, this hybrid concepts approach. Um, we argue that, that regulation should articulate clear goals for privacy protection. Um, and these goals should be consistent with uh, legal and technical um, understandings. Um, the goal should be in line with the scientific understanding of privacy. Um, they should also be understood by legal and policy experts. Regulation should move away from implicitly or explicitly endorsing ad hoc de-identification techniques. Um, and an example of a regulation that moves in this direction um, um, is, is the GDPR, or more specifically, some guidance on European data protection law that outlines goals that go beyond the traditional notion of de-identification. Um, guidance that um, refers to protection from singling out, linking, or inferring an individual's personal data from a data set um, provides more specificity than um, concepts such as personally identifiable information. Um, however, these concepts have not yet been defined precisely and formally from a mathematical perspective, however, but they do aim to describe a, a clearer goal than um, previous regulations and guidance. And so it's a step in the right direction. Um, and if you're interested in this work, um, these publications provide a, a much more in-depth look at this research. Um, and I, I welcome any questions. Unfortunately, we are a bit uh, behind, so we have time for one quick question. Or uh, we can just move on, since there were questions during the talk. Maybe let's thank uh, Alex again.